Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. Our first Patreon goal is 100 Patreon subscribers for $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Senkos or a Jackhammer Chatterbait. For more information on our Patreon, please go check it out in the episode description down below. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. So hey, how did your um, how did your episode with uh, Ford facing sonar go? Have you seen the comment section? No, I haven't looked at it. Should I oh, dare? That's... Dude, it is rowdy, and I posted that on a couple of Facebook groups for yeah. promotion, and it's just like people are like threatening to kill each other. Oh my god, it is insane. Um, I like the call-in show idea, and I want to continue with that because. The amount of people, now here's the problem though. I don't have the money to have a burner phone yet, so I have to give them my phone number, which is was the dumbest thing. You have I could people have ever texting done. you and stuff? Yeah, that was no not smart. Shit. That was that was that was not smart. That was not smart. Um I got like fifty phone calls a night after this thing done. People leave me voice messages trying to get on the show to talk about it. So it was a hot topic. Really? It was a real hot topic, and I get it. People are passionate about it. I mean, I know some people are like, well, you should get rid of it or whatever. They think because I have it on my boat, that's all I do is just use live scope, and it's uh-huh. like, that's not true at all. When I'm when I'm at Big Slack on the Upper Potomac, only a couple of the fish I see hit the bait. Most of it is just knowing if they're on the bottom or if they're, like, suspended. That's yeah. basically what I use it for the most of. Um and you know that because, like, so much of the Upper Potomac right now, whether it's big slack or down near you, there's so much grass. So much grass. Oh, now. yeah. And I feel yeah. like those fish just get, as that grass lays over, I just feel like those fish really like to use that vegetation and compress there's some, Hey, there's some it. real big smallmouth hiding in those grasses. Oh, yeah. Big Massive. ones. Real big ones. What are they doing right now near you? They're just... um. You know, in the mornings, you can catch them out in the middle. You can catch them on, on um, like, you know, structure like rocks. Um, they've been on wood, too, like trees, submerged trees. But uh, it seems like around, uh, you know, late morning, early afternoon, they, they kind of, um, the bite dies off. And then uh, they'll pick back up in the evening. That's what I'm seeing, too. Yeah, but um, I had a guy uh, a couple weeks ago. He uh he hooked into one. I mean, this was a giant smallmouth. He hooked into it with a whopper plopper, a ninety size whopper plopper. And um, when I tell you it was big, I'm estimating that fish was six pounds. No, giant. Come on. It was, it was enormous. When it when it breached the water like a shark, it it came completely Dude. out of the water one time. And um, it just. It did. It didn't. Uh, it didn't work out for us, man. We got it close oh. to the boat. I was getting ready to. Um, I, I had the net ready. He just had to bring it another 10, 12 feet, and it, it head shook and said, "See ya." Were, was he using your tackle? Uh, no, no, he was using his own tackle, but he was using the same type. You know, same size whopper floppers I was using. Mm. Yeah, I mean, hey, this thing. When I tell you this thing was big, this thing was. This was a giant smallmouth in the middle of the summer late morning hitting a top water bait but he was in the grass Dude. ah gotcha yeah that that's what's so weird right now is like the amount that they jump it makes it so much harder to use treble hook baits i saw that a lot with um when i was fishing up at big slack on, on the upper potomac because that's where we have like little thursday nighters and stuff when we're fishing water that's about five feet plus in depth mm-hmm. i really don't try to like lean on them too much because they just want to go airborne right now they just want to jump on everything they do and oh like, they go oh, nuts Lord, man throw a hook they go nuts yeah and i think that's a hard thing that you probably deal with with your clients is like you don't want to lean on them too much where you force them to the surface to jump 24 7 because if they jump 24 7 like every time they leave the water there's a chance they're going to throw that hook well the, i don't think the hookup ratio with top water baits is very good to begin with a lot no. of times they hit them, they miss them. If they do hook up with them, um, there's a good chance they're going to come off. And I don't know why that is. I mean, even with those big hooks, um, I mean, they're just they just act, they just start acting crazy, man. When you hook them, hook up with them with like one of those whopper floppers. 
how did you get onto that Whopper Plopper bait? Uh, you mean this year? Yeah. I just that's the uh, one of the easier top waters to to run. You can you can pop it through the water. You can run it like a, a crank or like a uh, a buzz bait. Um, it's just a it's it's just something that they seem to um, hit regularly. I mean they they just they, they hit it um every summer. That ninety size is deadly too, dude. Yeah. They seem to be hitting the 90 better than that 75, if I'm saying that right. The one just below it. Yeah, why do you think that is? I, I think that, that I, maybe that 90 puts off a different a different um, sound or vibration in the water. Do I have that right now? No, I don't. I'll tell you something, another one that I've been actually catching them on, and I had to take the hooks off, was this uh, this Sammy Jr. Yeah, that's a, um, that's a, uh, a Lucky Craft, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. That one's been you ever, pretty good. Have you ever heard of a Kelly J? No. What's that? The Kelly J Jr. It's a prop bait that they sell. And it's got a prop on the front and a prop on the back. Oh, for Kelly Jordan. Yeah, Kelly J Jr. And it had the small one and they have a regular one. Well, the junior one works really well on smallmouth too. Let's whip this thing up here. Now, is this something that you carry in your store too? No, I don't have those. I should. I should start carrying them. I like them. Can I don't even have nice. any top water baits right now. Really? Yeah. Why not? I don't know. I just don't. Um. Well, River to Sea. I don't any 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 one of the uh, mm. distributors or or um, vendors. I guess you want to call them. Uh, they're just they're just not carrying them. Maybe they will eventually. Dude, I think what's really interesting right now, with all this heat and this, is this like a hundred year drought? What are people saying about it? Because have you seen pictures of the Rappahannock River right now? No. Oh, dude. Well, I I know this isn't the biggest drought. You know, this isn't. I mean, we were due for a drought, wouldn't you say? Oh yeah, we we were due for it. I was just like, it was, it was the severity of it when you look at some of these uh, reports. Well, if you look at the history on the of the Point of Rocks gauge, the lowest the water ever got was well below um, 0.1 feet, if I'm saying that right. It was like a half a foot or something like that, 0. 0.33 0. or something. It was back almost uh, probably 100 years ago. They had it, and they registered it at like 0. 0.33 feet. Dude, that's insanely down. Yeah, it's, oh, it's on the historical, it. um, if you look in there, you can see it. It's on the historical uh, uh, charts. Shoot. No, I do not have it. Darn it. Guys, so right above my head, because of the power of timestamps, will be a picture of the Rappahannock River right now. Because it was interesting. I was like, I saw on Facebook how they're saying, like, it is super low. Like, a lot of places, there's no flow. I know the Shenandoah, uh, Shenandoah Valley. There's parts of it that you're not allowed to fish the streams because it's the drought is so bad for trout and things like that. So, oh really? It's ins- yeah, it's insane. Like how low it's gotten. And, and are you seeing low levels right now in the Upper Potomac? No, no, no. They're at like, uh, what did I see today? Three, four, three, five. Uh, they 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 sometimes get below three feet at at the gauge at Edwards Ferry's gauge. How is for people that don't know, like how is three, four, three, five this time of year? Is that normal? Is that two? Is that low? Is that high? No, that's about in the summertime. That's about average. Somewhere about average. Three and a half and four feet. Yeah. Wow. Yep. Phew. I mean, the that's Potomac insane. Rivers. People don't realize the Potomac River's big. It's a. It's over mm-hmm. four hundred miles long. I mean, it's it's it, the watershed in the Potomac River is enormous. I mean, it's absorbing all that water from the Shenandoah River, um, the Monocacy River, uh, Antietam, you know, Antietam Creek, all these different locations that people know, you know, know of uh, Goose Creek. You know, it's just sucking all that water in. Well, this time of year with the water being, you know, where it is in that low pool, we're in September, early September. I feel like we're going to have an about Indian right summer. Up, about par, the water level is about par par for the course right now man is it par for the course? good 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 oh, that's good yeah. to know. 
Because I know with the Shenandoah, they're having issues with that, and so are they having with the Rappahannock. But well, so that's good for those, so. Well, those places are all tributaries to the uh, Potomac River, and and I guess you can kind of look at all those those rivers and creeks and streams. I mean, when when the water floods, when we get real high um, water levels, maybe not flood conditions, but we get um, above average uh, water levels, um, high water events on the river. The first things to go down are the, are the tributaries. Because the river absorbs all of that. It just sucks it mm. up. Within two or three days, the water is starting to fall a lot faster than the river is. I didn't know that. Yeah. And that's the, really the cool. creeks and the streams. And, and uh, I, I don't know about like a, a large body of or a large um, body of water like the Shenandoah, but um, they all start clearing up. And the river stays brown. And the creeks are starting to clear You'll start seeing like green water. Then it starts getting clearer and clearer and clearer. And um, I mean, w within two or three days, you can't get back up into the creeks like you could um, prior to that. So that's how, what that's parts? How, that's how fast the water falls. So what parts of the river are, let me rephrase this. Are there parts of the river that you can't access right now compared to other times of the year? So generally speaking, like you're you're really launching um, below Poolsville and Leesburg, generally speaking, if I'm not mistaken, near Seneca. Yeah, not, yeah, in the summertime I do. And the only reason I'm there right now is because the water level. It's just easy to run. Yeah. But uh, up above White's Ferry, um, like areas uh, behind or on the Maryland side of Mason Island, you could you wouldn't want to run a boat through there. And so what's Mason Island? Is it this one right here? It's public land. No, no. Which you one? Go, you have to go up a lot further. Go up past oh. uh, White's Ferry. That's Harrison Island right there. That's Mason Island right there. Harrison? No. This is Mason. Zoom in right there. What's that saying? It says uh, Mason. Yep. There's two <laughs> islands there. It looks like one big island, but if you go up, it's separated by a, a, a little creek or stream that cuts through. Does this stream or this portion of the river, is it basically dry at this time of year? Yeah, back behind there. I've gone through there uh, when it's real low. And um, yeah, luckily I was able to get through there, but it was bad. It was, I mean, it was, you, you could hear the rocks under the boat. Oh, wow. Yeah. You you don't want to run, you don't want to run back behind there unless the water's, um, uh, at like the Edwards Ferry gauge, if it's reading um, below four and a half feet. What is the fishing like from the Monocacy down to the island? Down to where? From Monocacy down to uh, Mason Island. Mason? Yeah. Oop, am I losing you? That's been pretty good. Yeah, it, yeah, it's just interesting because okay. you look at the way the monocacy dumps in. I know the monocacy can have its hot stretches. So just with that influx of water, is the monocacy, does it run colder or hotter this time of year? It runs about the same. Okay. Fascinating. Water temperature-wise. Interesting. I wouldn't have thought that. Maybe. Okay. You know, the monocacy river is just over 50 miles long. Maybe right at the uh, where, it, where it starts. It starts with two creeks that come together. In the, uh, from the state of Pennsylvania. And then hmm. on the Maryland side, it becomes one. It becomes a monocacy. Up I there, um, those creeks might be uh, cooler. But I not that. That's pretty cool. Not down in Frederick County, no. Hmm. Monocacy goes way up in there, man. By the way, guys, Google Maps, I just want to say, Google Maps is really awesome. It's cheap, and it gives you this great contour feature, which is super nice. Just to kind of show you the strike and dips of everything. I mean, Google Google Earth is awesome too, but I just been really falling in love with Google Maps uh, recently. Um, I can't believe how far it goes up there. That's another place I really want to fish is Lake uh, Liganora, Liganora. That place looks really cool. All the way to the golf course. No, Liganora. You're right, Liganora. I've Liganora. Thank you. Before. Yeah. What is it like? It's got a lot of largemouth in it. Really? Hmm. Yeah, it fishes pretty good. Is it public or private? It's public. Oh, I didn't there's know. There's just a lot of uh, there's just a lot of private homes around it. <laughs> it's public. You can get onto it. 
<laughs> yeah, it's public if you can get onto it, pretty much. Yeah. I wonder how many times that excuse has been made by teenage boys and stuff breaking into places. <laughs> uh, let's see. What was the other thing I had? Goose Creek. Have you been up into Goose Creek at all? No, not recently because it's so low. You you could you might you probably get seventy five yards up into Goose Creek from the mouth of it, and then the water's just too low. Yeah, I figured this time of year is one of the best times to actually do some wade fishing. Yeah. You could just you could just there's a section of river up above Mason Island where uh, you can walk from the Maryland side all the way to the Virginia side and it never gets above your knee. That's insane. They, uh, they also they've also I haven't seen them. Um, I'm not lucky enough to see it, but there's a there's a black bear that's living up above White's Ferry up around Mason's Island. And he's been seen on the Maryland side of Mason's Island and on the Maryland shoreline. And he's crossing over into Virginia, too. Wait, really? Yeah. Dude, that's freaking awesome. Yeah, that was told to me by a a game warden. Are you going to do any deer hunting this year? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to hunt at my house some. And um, if I can, if if I um, get enough motivation, I'll hunt some of these public um, islands. I feel like that would be a lot of fun, and you need to make that a service you do. The... uh, the islands would be fun because all you're going to do, I mean, you're not going to really set up on those islands. And I think the best way to hunt those islands would be to start at one end and walk real slow. So you would drop your gifts off at one end of the island and you would walk towards them. That seems safe. No, 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 no. <laughs> we would just, we would just start at one end and walk to the other and just see if we could oh. push one to, uh, to, uh, to get one. I'm telling you, you would have that whole market covered if you started to do hunt hunt boat trips. Or that'd even be, you did a that'd goose be fun, wouldn't it? Dude, that would be a blast. I would be one of your you customers know you for can, that. Uh, you know, you can hear shortly. I don't know if it's opened up yet or not. I haven't checked. It's just been so hot. Hunting isn't a um, uh, it's just kind of a thought in my mind. It's it's really not uh, deer season, and then goose season is going to open up. You can goose hunt and fish at the same time in September in Maryland on the Potomac. How does that? You just lay it's a shotgun Black next to your trolling motor. Huh? That's the it's name of blasting. it. That's that's the name of it. Blasting cast. I love it. Yeah. Oh you my shoot, god. Um, shoot. Uh, you know, you have your shotgun in the boat. Have it set up the way it's supposed to for geese, and uh, it's, it's residential geese. And uh, you could be fishing, floating down the middle of the river, and you're fishing, and they don't probably think they don't think anything of it, um, because you're they see people on boats all the time, and if they're flying low enough, you drop your poles and shoot them blasting cast dude that is a freaking that is branding right there I, what does goose taste like it's dark meat that's pretty good but i mean I, i'm not a i'm not like a gourmet chef or anything but if you get the right person to cook anything it's gonna taste good you know hmm. guys let me know in the comment Any section down below game. guys let me know in the comment section down below like what is your favorite way to prepare goose because i have no idea i need to eat more i, I used to eat a lot of venison growing up uh, wild turkey tastes good hunt. when you deep fry it i've heard that i've heard if you yeah. don't cook it well though it really sucks yeah if you deep fry it it tastes real good and um i've never done it with goose i've had goose before just grilled it and stuff but um uh, maybe if you fry a goose it would taste good Ooh. Hey, you can do that for Thanksgiving. You can burn down your house with the uh, the old deep fried goose. Well, the only reason people catch stuff on fire with those things is they'll throw like a frozen turkey into a vat of hot oil. And if you've ever seen it, when you've you've ever taken a um, ice cube and dropped it in uh, boiling water, what it does? It snaps and crackles and pops. It yeah. sounds real violent. Yeah. Yeah, man. That's the reason why that happens. And that hmm. and that grease. Hops out of the um, the uh, pot and catches stuff on fire because it's so darn hot. Well, with that said, as we segue back to the old the old fishing talk, yeah. H- how do you deal with all this vegetation right now with your guides, with your guests, not your guides? <laughs> uh, I'm fishing in a lot of spots where they're uh, where it's just open, and then if 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 we are fishing in grass, we're fishing we're fishing with. Um, plastics obviously um sink goes uh what else any anything you can make weedless do the fish actually uh, 
the Z-Man ticklers, they work real good in the, in the grass. Yeah, my, one of my, my co-angler uh, absolutely loves that bait, just swears by it. And I'm going to tell you what, um, with the grass, uh, you don't need real heavy weight. I mean, they're not going to see it anyways if it's in the grass. So you just got to work it through and hope and hope when you're when you're casting and you're fishing out there in these in certain areas, you're casting into the open areas of the grass, you know, and then um, you're going to work it through the grass and hopefully one actually sees it, you know, falling or, or moving through the grass and they'll, they'll grab it. With, with that said, what weight do you like to use with it? Any anything from a 16th ounce to an eighth ounce. OK, and is that on that the lighter you go in the river, the better. And is that on that special head by Z-Man? No, I've been using throwing my um, my jig head. Ooh, that I pour. Okay, it's a sixteenth ounce. I have sixteenth ounce, three thirty second ounce, and eighth ounce. Let's see them. Yeah, here. Let me. Uh, do I have? Where do I have them? Well, you better have some. It's gonna be a lot harder to sell them if you don't have them. Yeah, I got some. I got to get them out of my boat. Don't worry, guys. I will be going down to uh, his humble abode here in the next couple of weeks when I get back from uh, the beach, and I'm going to be helping Jeff set up a nice studio for his uh, for his future plans and his OnlyFans account. Yeah. All right. So here we go. This one's not the prettiest looking one. Of course, I don't really care as long as they uh, get the bait from the bottom. This one's been used. It's on a number one extra wide gap hook. Can you see it? Yeah, I can see it perfectly. Hold on. There we go. Oh, right there. Yeah. Neat head. And they're just over four dollars a pack, and there's there there's six to a pack. And then so. guys, with those type of heads, I suggest again, you don't have to use a strong suggestion. Go buy yourself a little bit of the fast super glue from like Home Depot yeah. and just give it a, a dab of, of glue. <laughs> yeah, this one's beat up. This was one that um, I cut to get out of a fish. So that oh, really? The, yeah, the hook's missing. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, these are nasty hooks, man. They um, they hook the heck out of the fish. And, and then well, what, I, what I mean by that is, is um, when it hooks them in the side of their mouth or in the roof of their mouth or in the, somewhere in the lip, um, they're not just head shaking it off. Is that a one odd or is that a two odd? That's the number one hook and the extra wide gap, number one. Mm. So the smaller the number for just numbers like one, two, three, four, the bigger. The small, but and then it's reversed for one odd. Or I'm sorry, then it, yeah, it's reversed for one odd, two odd, three odd, four odd. The higher number you go in the uh, one odd, two odd side of it, the bigger the hook goes. You have it here, guys. There you go. What's your favorite color tickler this time of year? Green pumpkin. <laughs> Ooh. Nothing fancy, man. Green pumpkin, everything. And then um, um, I've got these baits called bug baits. They they um, mimic a um, uh, Helgramite. And I like those in black. I, 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 seem to, I feel like the black color of the bug bait um, is better than the green pumpkin or the... Uh, uh, the other, the brown color I have. I also like every now and then I'll just I'll just splash it with a little bit of chartreuse on the tip. Uh huh. Every now and yeah. then I feel like it helps, especially there's a lot of bluegill. Yeah, they uh, uh, they're eating a lot of crawdads too right now. They're spitting them up. I'm finding them on my boat. It's nasty. This September, what are their what is their behavior like this September with what they're eating and what they're trying to do right now? Cause it's a little weird because it's the calendar says September, but it's as hot as August. Well, that's because it, it just hasn't started cooling down yet. Once it cools down, uh, once, once we, you know, once the, um, September catches up to what month it's actually in, which is September it should be next week or so. Uh, the water's going to start cooling down. I think next week I saw a temper. I don't usually look too far ahead. I'm only looking like two, three days ahead for trips and stuff um, uh, because I'm not canceling trips unless uh, usually very, it, it, there has to be a certain reason and I can't think of one right now, but it's happened to me in the past. Um, if I cancel a trip because of, because of, uh, you know, unsafe conditions, whatever they may be, 
it's usually 24, 24 hours out because you can't trust the weather forecast. Are there any big hurricanes on the horizon you think that is really going to affect that with dumping cold rain onto the system? No. There's one that's working right now out in the Atlantic or wherever the heck it's coming from. And um, I don't know what that one's got. I mean, that one's that one's nowhere. It's not even near the um, North American continent. <laughs> yeah, so I, cause I, I, don't, I don't know. I'm curious how how that kind of rain will affect fishing and what it will do to it. So like example is out of curiosity is if we get a cold rainstorm or a cold snap, like will that immediately shut down the topwater bite or how will that affect? their? No, behavior? I think, Hey, recently, if you can remember, remember back in August, we had a few mornings where it dropped down into the fifties. Do you remember that? Recently, no, I'm getting old. I'm getting old. I can't remember. So two days ago, we had a few mornings where it dropped it down into the 50s and the water went from 84. So let's say 84 degrees because it was in the mid 80s, right? 84 degrees. And it went down to like 77 degrees. And I noticed that those fi the, the fish just weren't. Um, they didn't like it. At least the, the fish on the Potomac didn't like it. Mm -hmm. and it's the only thing I could think of that really um, affected their um, what would affect them. I mean, you wouldn't think that cooler water would affect them like that since it's summer but it's just the opposite you know if the water's in the winter time if it's one temperature and it drops five degrees overnight fishing could be hard the next day it really can and i just feel like like at least for me recently with with the amount i've been blessed that i've actually gotten to fish more consistently this summer it's been a while since i've been this consistent and i feel like the fish are just really pressured uh, i the way i've gotten consistently Here's here's a better here's a better example of one that hasn't been drug on the bottom of the river um, over and over. Oh, nice. So, all right. What were you saying? I forget. What was I going with that? Oh, just how important casting distance is right now and going slow and working a spot. When I was on the trolling motor trying to blow through an area, wasn't catching them. Then what I started to do is go super slow. I'm blessed because I have power poles. And so what I would do is power pole down, fish a section really hard, creep up, power pole down, and just creep up the river. Yeah. And I got I got the second biggest fish. I, I lost big fish pot by two ounces. But it was that I really figured out that when the water's this low, you can't just push through too fast because you're going to just scare them away. You have to go slow and creep yeah, until you, you find like, the juice. Up. You got to be ca be able to cast really far off uh, away from the boat, and that, that's kind of what's going to tie it in with you. Is like so when you hit your when you find a spot that you want to fish, how how early are you setting the boat down? Gen just generally speaking. What do you mean once I get to the spot? Yeah, I'm, I'm assuming you're not dropping right on the spot, right? No, no, oh, yeah, I go above the spot and I start working down. Okay, you go downstream. Okay, I, I work I work up river and I'll drift down. And that way I don't have to use my trolling motor as much. And uh, it's, I guess, a little bit more, I, I feel like it's quiet that way. And I'll drift down and then I'll spot lock. And I'll just keep, you know, go down five or ten feet. Can you see me now? Oh, yes. I don't know what the heck's going on. It might be my service. We will we will pioneer through. Is it doing it again? Perfect. Technical difficulties aside, we always persevere here with our technological savvy. Yeah. So to continue with what we were talking about, uh, with approaching these these spooky fish this time of year, are you just working? You're not working the clump of grass itself. You're working the pockets in between, correct? Could you go into that a little bit more? Yeah, I'm, I'm just working. Um, well, first off, I'm going to be in. I'm going to try to be in areas where I, I feel like there's a larger population of fish, because it seems to me like they move around. I mean, sure, there's fish all over the river, but I think the majority of them move together. And so one day they'll be, they'll be 500 yards down the river. And the next day they'll be 300 yards back up river. You know what I mean? Okay. And then that's where most of them are. And then, yeah, you're going to work the areas in between the grass where the water, where the, where the water's open and clear. What makes them move? I, I have the bait, what they're eating. I think the smallmouth go into, go into an area and just, destroy it you know <laughs> and then they uh then they move now i don't now if you ask me well um why do they go back to that area i don't know i guess the the bait moves back into that area i, I don't know um 
And then certain times of the year, I think they prefer like crawdads over uh, uh, minnows. And I'm, I'm sure minnows can move up and down the river a lot better than the crawdads can. You know? I agree with that. So they're always chasing those, um, I say minnows, but small fish that are considered bait fish, whatever they may be. Um, I think they chase them all over the river. And then I think they'll get into areas that are full of uh, like little crustaceans on the ground, on the bottom of the river, like crawdads or those helger mites. And they'll get into an area that's probably pretty populated with them and they'll stay there and they'll, they'll, they'll sit there and um, just destroy that area and eat as many as they can. And then they'll move on. When do you think those changes happen when they focus on one versus the other? Um, seasons. What I season are we in now? July, August, like August and September. They've been eating a lot of crawdads. I would imagine those are a lot harder to eat than a minnow. But you don't what have do you to think? move as much. I think that's I think that's the the turn like that's the compare and contrast, so to speak. It's like you can sit at a hole and stare at it, but it's yeah, a pain in the ass. To eat it. I don't know. No, I agree. Yeah. I don't think anyone knows. I think I think it's have a, uh, have an, they have an educated guess on, on what it is, but from what I think I, it's a fun conversation. But from what I see is they move constantly. I, I think Jeff Little talks about this too that the, those fish constantly move. They they they'll do circles and they'll like have three or four points that they'll be in and they'll just roam from one place to another. And I really do feel like that that's kind of what they do is if they have three or four ambush points, they're going to stake out at one, be there for a while, move on to another one, be there for a while, move on to the other one. And I think it's just, it's a microcosm. And I think you see this on different bodies of water that smallmouth are in. I think the only difference really would be like the St. Lawrence River where you have the goby population. I don't know how much those smallmouth move comparatively to other smallmouth, honestly. I feel like the smallmouth that are on like the St. Lawrence probably don't move as much as on the Shenandoah River just because the gobies, they're just kind of locked in there with all the gobies. Um, but I don't know. It's a very interesting thing to, to, to think about. W- when does the fall bite really start in your opinion? Oh, doggy. I didn't know you had a dog. Yeah, I have two of them. What's his, what are their names? Sadie and Bumbelina. Bumbelina? Yep. Bumbelina. Like Thumbelina, but Bumbelina. Trust me. Like, if you met the dog, you'd realize that's why her name's so dumb. She's not that's exactly freaking, the sharpest tool in the shed. That's freaking awesome. She might be the dumbest dog I've I've ever known. <laughs> like so she's smart, like you can train her. She'll you know, she'll do whatever you ask her to do, but um you have to save her from herself. Like every five minutes, um, she's doing something she shouldn't be doing. And she's eight years old, and she still does crap like that. That's freaking awesome. Um, so really the last thing, honestly, to get into today is kind of like, where do you think the river is right now? And where do you think the river's going fishing report wise? Oh, I think it's good. Um, I mean, uh, the grass is definitely going to help. Uh, if, you know, if we keep having, um, just rain, just enough rain to keep water in the river. Um, I think that that's going to be great, but I guess we could afford to have a couple high water events that are, um, you know, uh, put a lot of water into the, into the river, especially if it's going to happen. I, I, I think the best time for it to happen would be in the winter time. Um, cause I think a lot of the fish, like the, um, uh, the new fish and all that stuff that, uh, from the, um, spring, I, I think they have a better chance of surviving, but I, I don't think there's any problem with the, with, with us having high water events. No, I agree. I agree. As long as it don't happen back to back to back to back and constantly happen, um, I don't think it affects them. I think they just keep moving along and doing their thing. But uh, I, mean, I, just, I think the fishing is going to be even better next year. Why? Just because we've had a cup. Cu- we've had a couple really good years. There's more fish. And there's going to really? be more fish. Yeah, yeah it's crazy because I really think we're approaching the golden era for that part of the upper Potomac. Um, our portion up where I'm at in Williamsport, it's weird because we have so many fish that are 11 and a half inches long. We have, a that's ton. what you want. 
Yeah, that's what you want. And the summertime is the best time. You know, that's that's when you're going to see them. Eight inch, ten inch, twelve inch fish, and they're all over the place. Why do you want that? Well, because next year they'll be even bigger. That just shows you how um, how many fish there are in the river. You know, hmm. I mean, the, um, the bigger they get, uh, they I think they learn a few things over time, and uh, they're just not as easy to catch when they're bigger. But I'm saying, but but there's tons of big fish in the river. So, you know, you just, there's, it, yeah. And I'll tell you what I've, what I've seen. Um, and, and I think is, is, is real is, um, if you're out there fishing on the river and the weather changes and the storm's coming in and, you know, you start getting that wind and you start feeling cool air when the, when the air was, uh, prior to that was warm and, you know, and you see a front coming in, those big fish come out and it's just, you know, if you're out there when it happens, You'll, you'll catch a real big one. It doesn't happen right away, but if, if you're out there and you can you can safely keep fishing, and that's that that front keeps getting closer and closer and closer, um, you'll hook into just a monster fish at some point. That's freaking awesome. That, so, w- when do you think the fall will really get here? I think probably uh, beginning of October. Beginning of October. Yeah, I think it'll be. Uh, I think I think this fall is going to be awesome. I mean, there's going to be just some gigantic fish out in the river. The Susquehanna okay. and the Potomac. Give us some weights. What do you think? What do you think the biggest one will be that you catch between now and Thanksgiving? Um, probably another one that's over 22 inches. That's nice. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say a 23 inch fish, but um, do do I do I think there's fish that exist that are seven pounds in the, in the Upper Potomac River? I do. I think so. I mean, because um, if you catch a six-pound fish in the uh, mouth of where the uh, Shenandoah or the Potomac or up around Harper's Ferry, anywhere, you catch a fish um, that's six and a half pounds, like they ha- like people have been catching the past couple of years, those aren't the biggest fish in the river. You never catch the biggest fish. No, and I think if someone catches a seven-pound fish, I think you can say that's not the biggest fish in the river. I think that you you mentioned a spot though. I really do think that hole at Harper's Ferry is is the juice. That hole right below and guys, I'll bring it up on the old count show, show you here. This hole right here where these two rivers meet. There's got to be a monster that just lives right there. I mean, people have caught in the past 3 or 4 years, people have caught um 6 pound smallmouth up in the Shenandoah. Mhm. In that area. I've heard, um, and I believe, uh, the real big smallmouth are probably in western Maryland on the Potomac River, in the areas that are really hard to get to, that are very remote. Oh, I think I know where you're talking about, all the way up into this area. Oh, let me get it way up here. You're talking up here near Hancock. Yeah, and further north. Into Paul Paul and little New Orleans. Yeah. yeah, I think if you're up there at the right time, right place, right time. Um, I think, I think you might catch something that, uh, that's giant up there. Well, it's crazy is how many feeder creeks you have up in here. I mean, if you look at this topographical map of Google earth and you look at how many creeks just dump right into this thing, um, uh-huh. all that water gets dumped in here and guys, I don't know. We might have something, we might have something special planned for this. We might have something special planned for this, uh, fall and winter for you guys. But first, what you're going to have to do to make it work you're going to have to go over to uh, my Patreon page and give us a follow there and help us hit our goals so we can make a lot of this stuff happen. We can get new drones and really help with some of our cool goals that we have because that's what's going to be able to make us do a really cool documentary series about this part of the Upper Potomac River. With If you're going to put some time in, you know, there's a deer out There's a deer out in, out in my, um, behind my house right now. I can hear him snorting. Well, can you see? Can you show show us with the camera? No, it's too dark now. But oh, he was just snort- I just heard one just snorting. Something spooked. Um, but uh, I think once you get up into uh, that part of the Potomac River, in the Western Maryland, um, uh, like Little Orleans area, and further north, in places like that, um, I, I think those areas you, you have to be uh, uh, ready 
uh, to fish up there and stuff, I, I think you need to bring other things along with you because that's in the middle of nowhere. You're not joking. It is yeah. the middle of nowhere. I mean, nowhere. And you, you have to be uh, prepared for, uh, um, you know, more things than what you um, think you might be prepared for uh, down below um, Point of Rocks or Lander or something like that. I mean, that, that area is in the middle of nowhere. There's stretches of river there that are 17 miles without a boat ramp. Well, speaking of being prepared, I believe you got your boat prepared for things like that. With uh, You got a new purchase, didn't you? What do you mean? Your motor. Oh, yeah, yeah. I have a new outboard. I repowered the boat. My, uh, my other outboard, it's for sale. It's actually pending right now. We'll see what happens tomorrow. But I have it for sale right now for $4,500. Uh, but that's a, um, or best offer. So if uh, anyone's interested in a jet boat, you know, contact me, call me, leave me a text, email me. You can go on my websites, my two websites, my Shallow Water Fishing Adventures website or SWFA website or SWF Baits website and contact me. Jeff, thank you so much again for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Link in the episode description to everything that we talked about today. The show is still going to continue on Patreon for all of my Patreon supporters. If you'd like to join Patreon, link in the episode description or click on this box right here. We'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.